It is now time for Diary of a Wrestling Fan with Bill Chase. And now, here he is, the man who's never once watched any single episode of Tiger King. He really means it. Bill Chase! Thank you, thank you, Mr. Podcast Announcer, and welcome to another edition of Diary of a Wrestling Fan. The podcast that chronicles my 33 and now almost 34 amazing years of being a fan of the wonder that is professional wrestling thank you for listening on spotify on anchor wherever podcasts are streamed hit subscribe hit follow whatever format you're listening from allows you to do to keep up with this podcast and if you're listening on youtube which very few of you are hit that subscribe button all right well i am back after a hiatus um i've had a lot of things going on personally uh i'm not gonna get into really but uh Either way, it's it's just been been not such a good time. I'll just I'll just go on and say that. Uh, but again, if any of my close friends are listening, and they know who they are. Uh, thank you for uh, the support that you were able to give. So, without any further ado, I'm back, which is why uh, today I'm recording two episodes. I'm going to release uh, two episodes this week. So there you go. Uh, I'm going to release uh, the. Actually, you know what? I'm actually going to release two in the same day. That's right. I'm going to give you all a double feature. And I'm going to uh, promise give what I promised, those Royal Rumbles. Okay, so let's get right to it. This is Royal Rumble 2014. Actually, no, I'm sorry. We're not going to get right to it because I do have to give a quick plug, of course, to Pro Wrestling Ontario. That's right. Pro Wrestling Ontario. Amazing action. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you scroll over the video, if you're listening to this on YouTube, scroll over the top of the video, top right corner, there's a link to the channel. How do you listen to the podcast? Hit that link, hit subscribe, watch the videos, hit like. We got complete shows. New episodes of Foundation every Saturday at 3 p.m. They go up live. Check them out. We have we had a recent great episode, the open weight title match between the Canadian bad boy Tyler Hill and the very unhinged Corey Stone. So check that out. Independent wrestling fans, you will love it, I guarantee it. So also follow us on social media. We're on Twitter. We are on Instagram. We're also on Facebook. Give us a like there as well. We keep you updated with the happenings in Pro Wrestling Ontario. We still have a lot going on despite the ongoing pandemic. So at least we're grateful for that. And uh, yeah, so if you're uh, d- if you're desiring some wrestling action and you're not necessarily digging into WWE these days, which I don't know, lately, usually from Rumble to WrestleMania it gets interesting no, no matter what the product's like or whatever. So, but either way, if you just want to check out some different wrestling content and you're bored at home... Hit up Pro Wrestling Ontario. All right, so indeed, we're going to do Royal Rumble 2014 today, uh, otherwise known as the Daniel Bryan Protest Show. That's right. Fans really made it known how they feel about the WWE's direction at this time going into uh, the WrestleMania season. Also, uh, the show dubbed CM Punk's Last Stand. And indeed, this was a very captivating time for the WWE, CM Punk's growing frustration. I mean, I can get into the whole story about this, but Punk's podcast with Colt Cabana is still up. You know, the lawsuits and everything. Keep in mind, though, Punk and Colt won. So they're still up on YouTube. Uh, check them out. There's two of them. There's like a nice little um, sequel, if you will, follow up that Punk did the, the week after the Biggie. And so check them both out. They're both really, really good. Uh, also, check out CM Punk's interview. I don't know if you've seen it on StarCast, StarCast 3. Check it out. All right, so we're going to get right to it now. Um, leading up to this show, Daniel Bryan was riding a wave of popularity. Now, there's been a lot of arguments uh, disputing whether or not Daniel Bryan was, you know, this whole thing was their plan. I mean, WWE might try to tell you that was their plan all along, and it might have been. But see, from what I can gather, unless, you know, again, Daniel Bryan might be working us, uh, yeah, and it's possible, but uh, apparently there's also the other side saying that they really, really, truly wanted Batista to be the guy to main event WrestleMania. And again, this is what really began a problem I find in WWE uh, in terms of watching their TV in the last several years, and it's, again, I've said this time and time again, it's not the talent. It seems to be short-term solutions for long-term issues. And it's like, okay, they'll get eyes on the product, you know, in a certain way when they bring in a celebrity. And again, like, it's going on right now with Bad Bunny. Yes, Bad Bunny will get eyes on the product. I don't doubt that. If they eventually bring in, you know, someone like Cardi B, which is often been rumored, 
then yes, that'll get eyes on the product. But the problem is the eyes are not staying on the product. You know, when when they bring in somebody like Cindy Lauper or Mr. T or you know even fast forward to Mike Tyson. Uh, it kept eyes on the product. Now, there's nothing wrong with these short-term celebrity solutions. That's fine. You know, it still gives your given show a good number. But again, it, there's no question. That, yes, yes, I know they're making money. Okay, that's I'm not disputing that. But clearly, there's uh, certain things that just aren't aren't giving it to a, a lot of fans. Like, th- th- you know what I mean? They're not really captivating much. Uh, of the same kind of audience that even at this time they were drawing. They were still drawing a pretty solid audience at this point. I mean, it's almost like they'd kill for ratings uh, as good as they were getting it in 2014. So, and as I was saying, now Daniel Bryan, of course, had the, it was the whole, uh, you know, your good B-level player story, which was a great story, I gotta, I gotta say. And you know what? What I really dug about it is that it, it was a very old school angle in the sense that it built sympathy on a baby face. That fans were, it gave fans even more of a reason to like Daniel Bryan. And it seems as though that there are times where baby faces will just say, okay, he's a baby face, so people will support him. No, you still got to give people reasons time and time again to support them. I mean, it's, it's as if. It's, it's, it's as if emotional investment takes a back seat. And at least with this Daniel Bryan story, whether it was a long-term plan or not, whether they really did truly feel that he didn't belong in the WrestleMania main event, it it means to me that they at least cared about him enough to give him this type of story. So at least that can't be disputed. But it seemed as though he was being shunted down the card. Um, he entered in this program with the Wyatt family where he even teased joining them. Again, one of the weirdest angles that only lasted... Oh, not even like not even two three weeks barely. So again, was this they to be testing the waters? Did they really want Dana Bryan to join the Wyatt family, or was this just to kind of tease the fans? We'll never really know. But again, there are many different accounts, and some people could be working. Some people, I don't know. The point is, it's just the fans were not responding well to it. But again, so it it was would lead to Daniel and Bray. Bray Wyatt here at the Royal Rumble show. So another thing, so another big thing leading to this is the frustration of CM Punk. CM Punk, of course, was in a feud with Cryback, or sorry, Ryback, and it was not very good at all. <laughs> now, I don't hate Ryback as much as a lot of people do. He just never did it for me. But and that's just me personally. I'm sure you know, he had a following, clearly. But at this point, Ryback was a heel anyway, so it just, it never, you think everything Punk had done, you know, the pipe bomb, um, the, even the feud with The Undertaker, feuding with The Rock, uh, even the feud with Jericho had its moments, like, and this is what I mean, the the stuff with Brock even, that, from the summer, it, it seemed a little below what he was doing before, and I understand sometimes you got to take a bit of a backseat before you move forward. But I, 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 and also at this time, they're bringing back the New Age Outlaws on television in a move I just, I, I couldn't stand it. I liked the Outlaws when I was a teenager because, well, pretty much their whole gimmick was being geared towards a lot of kids my age. But when you're, and again, nothing, nothing against Road Dog or Billy Gunn, my dear Road Dog, one of the biggest ap- apologists I've ever met. He. He never seems to, I guess you could say, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Care. What the fans think. He has spent countless hours on Twitter telling everyone they're wrong. And, uh, you know, it's... it's to me, it's it's become it's also become like an us versus them mentality in terms of the WWE and their fans and whatnot and seemingly trolling them in some ways. And even... People like Jim Ross have alluded to this in the past. So, if that's the way they want to go about it, then so be it, I suppose. But, I don't know, Road Dog's attitude, I just it's something very off-putting about it. And, again, b- b- both guys, again, like, Billy Gunn still look great. Road Dog look like, well, Road Dog. <laughs> but, my God, they, they the matches they were having in this run were... Oh, my... I... <laughs> 
I, I couldn't watch them. I was changing the channel most of the time because I'm like, this is just sad. And it's in the PG era. I'm sorry, this gimmick does not work in the PG era. And so the last match Punk had on television was with Billy Gunn, and my God, was it awful. It was one of the worst Punk matches I have ever seen. And it just, I mean, at least Punk won and went over, but I, I highly doubt that was much of a reward for Punk. So... Going into this show, there's a lot of issues happening with the WWE, and now yes, Batista. Batista had recently come back. Um, you would think that he would have momentum coming back, because he'd been gone for a better part of four years almost at this point. So, he was a, a very popular wrestler <laughs> for many years. Uh, again, only again, you know, you ha- every every era has their Hogan and Savage is the, probably the 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 benchmark you could really compare everything to, or Austin Rock even, for this era, they were them. You know what I mean? The, the Cena and Batista were, were in that level for this era. And I have to say as well, it just didn't... It, it wasn't clicking. Fans wanted a new star, and they wanted Daniel Bryan. I mean, Daniel Bryan and the yes chance. I mean, he got one of the most most used words in the world over as his thing. And at the same time, though, because people, oh, yes, the, the what they call the anti-smarks, which, again, a term I always found hilarious because some people proudly refer to themselves as that when they are just as obnoxious and uh, toxic as the people they're making fun of. His, his catchphrase and his chant is over. Well, that would explain why his merch sales did so well. Oh, but that could still be because of the, the chant and the, the, the catchphrase. Um, okay, well, from what I could tell, people were into his matches, uh, so they appreciated his abilities as a wrestler and to fight back from behind as a babyface. So, uh, most Daniel Bryan fans I met, are they don't say, oh, I love him because of the yes chant. <laughs> You know what I mean? And that's just people I met. I mean, hey, maybe for some fans it is just his catchphrase or his chant. But the point is, they're still supporting him and they're still watch, paying to watch him. So there goes that logic out the window that these anti smarks tried to come up with. So we're going to get to the uh, event itself here in a second. So, you know, <laughs> the build up, of course, to one of the big matches on the show was indeed the. Finally, once again, even though it wouldn't last long, once again, unifying the championships. Because why not? (sighs) Look, I'm not against that, okay? It's been done many, many times. But at the same time, though, it's nothing against Randy Orton. And John Cena. I mean, when they did the whole championship unification thing uh, at TLC, and then they built up the big rematch here. There's nothing, again, nothing against John Cena and Randy Orton, but again, this is just, it's a, it was a telltale sign of things going on at the time. It's just, it, it had been done, and it's, 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 I mean, it's okay to go back to, uh, Go back to a story or a feud that generates interest. And at times, Orton and Cena have had really good programs and feuds together. To me, it just seemed... I don't know, just... As, like, on a personal level, it just didn't seem to have a spark to it at all. And judging by the way some people were reacting, I think that was the same, the same consensus for a lot of people. So this was the big rematch coming up at the uh, Royal Rumble. So now, oh, oh, sorry, I got, I got to add one more thing because this Punk's ongoing frustration with the company. One memorable moment, uh, which led up to the unification match when they did that promo, where Stephanie was on the microphone talking about you know great former champions and. Puts over, of course, her husband as one of the best. And you just see Punk's reaction in the background, which became a, a meme and a gif for a while. Gif, 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 whatever, gif, gif I don't know. On on uh, social media. 
and it's still used to this day in a lot of uh, a lot of fashions. So <laughs> I found that very I found that very amusing, and I think. Par- I think part of that was, you know, obviously at work, but I don't know. I think there was something in Punk's head knowing where the direction he was headed that made him shake his head in frustration there. All right, so in the pre-show, now we get to the event itself. Now, I watched this at a place called Club Absinthe in Hamilton, Ontario, where I am from. Absinthe is a famous downtown bar here in the city, and you know what? They had a nice Royal Rumble party uh, on a little bit of a big screen there. And so I was there with my girlfriend at the time, as well as a few friends from the local wrestling scene, including my buddy Justin Coleman. And yeah, it was uh, it was a fun night for a lot of us to mark out. My my boy Brandon Bryce was there as well. Um, was just starting to really kind of connect with him again after not seeing him for a while. So yeah, it was a fun atmosphere. Lots of fans there. So yes, Royal Rumble 2014, it took place on January 26, 2014, of course. Uh, Attendance of well over 15,700 people, legit sellout apparently, and had a pay-per-view buy, excellent pay-per-view buy of 467,000 buys, down a bit from the prior year, but let's keep in mind, The Rock and CM Punk was the main event prior year, anything with The Rock, of course, is going to draw a lot of attention, and so, either way, though, an excellent number, yeah, you really can't, uh, you really can't sneeze at that, so, yes, and then in a pre-show, we had the New Age Outlaws, Win the tag team titles. Yes, the New Age Outlaws win the tag team titles from the Dusts. Well, Cody Rhodes and Gold Dusts, if you will. Because why not? Again, I, I just. The outlaw, this Outlaws run was not doing it for me. Then we get to the actual show. Now, keep in mind, folks, that you know at the time that it be could be very frustrating to watch at this point, and I'm, and people often point to the whole entitled fans thing. All right, the thing is, you look at history. Fans wanted Hogan as their top guy. They got it. There was a time fans wanted Macho Man as their top guy. They got it. When business was down. In the early 90s, fans the, the fans that were still there wanted Bret Hart as their guy. They got it. They wanted Steve Austin as their guy. You see where I'm going here? You, you, you see where I'm going, fans? Was that a sense of entitlement? Oh, goddamn, pal. Oh, all well, these fans. Let's just give them what they want to shut them up. Probably said never by Vince. Either way, like, yes, of course, there's going to be times where Vince is going to try his experiments. And I will say this in Vince's defense, in his many experiments, that yes, they some say he shoved them down our throats, maybe he has. But more often than not, whether you want to go make the Roman argument, like many, and that's a whole separate podcast for another day, for the record, I, I love Roman these days, especially. And I've never had a problem with his work. I've never had a problem with him as a performer, so there you go. So sorry to disappoint some of you. Uh, but be that as it may, there are many specifics in that situation that would take up a whole podcast. But um, my point is that whether it's like a, a Snitsky or you know Vince's big man of the month or a, a Tensai, a smiling white meat baby face diesel... <laughs> For the most part, even if it sometimes takes him a long time, Vince will realize it's not working and he'll go back to the dry board again. Lex Luger, you know, he knew that wasn't working the way he wanted it to. I'm not saying, I'm not going to be one of those guys that says Lex wasn't over. He was. I just obviously don't, don't think it was on the level Vince was hoping. And he went back to Brett. So, no, I don't think it's a, much of a sense of entitlement thing. For the most part, The top guys that the fans wanted to cheer as their top baby faces, we got them. So yes, on with the show. Okay, sorry, I, I'm all over the place again here. I go off on these tangents. 
So I should also point out too that this was the last Royal Rumble pay-per-view to actually just be strictly on pay-per-view. Um, there, the network would launch a couple months later. Remember, there was big hype for the network at this point. I was looking forward to the network from the get-go, to be perfectly honest. So now we move to the opening match, which is Daniel Bryan versus Bray Wyatt. Now, Bray has often been a very protected character in many ways, despite the confusing booking of The Fiend at times. But either way, he's a guy that, for the most part, they've tried to protect over the years, especially early on. Now, we can go on about the whole Cena feud, but again, that even, I wouldn't say, I would, uh, he wasn't buried, okay? Let's just clear that up right now. Maybe it just could have been presented in a different way, I suppose, but really, it was actually, I, I actually like the Cena Bray Wyatt feud. I might be in the minority there, but I enjoyed it. So this match was actually really good. This might have been Bray's best match to date. And I've, I've always loved the Bray Wyatt character. I love the Fiend character. But in terms of actual matches, again, he can you know, he can go in the ring. But I'm just saying this, was his, this might have been his best match. This is a very underrated gem. But again, it gets forgotten because A, of the show it was on and everything, all the circumstances surrounding it. And B, the fact that, again, you know where Daniel Bryan was headed at this time, fans didn't seem to really like it all that much. This show, I should mention, is pretty much the definition of a frustrated fan base. And if I could be, in a, in a weird way, it's almost as if WWE never fully recovered from this in some ways. I don't know, in terms of, you know, their their fan base and whatnot, and in terms of that, those, 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 those live crowds. I should specify, they seem to lose their live crowds more often than not to this, but again, people are still paying to go, so whose fault is it really? So, I actually, again, I really enjoyed, it was a good back and forth, just typical heel baby face formula, and I'm not even saying that as a criticism, that's the way it should be. And it built up to a really good, exciting finish where Bray catches Daniel and hits him with a sister Abigail on the railing, which was an amazing spot. And Daniel only took some um, like um, like insane sister Abigails from Bray leading up to this for the last few months, and my goodness, was could he take them like a champ? But Bray put him in for another one, kind of killed the crowd. But as Road Dog would say, let, let, let's. Let it play out and see where it goes. Okay. <laughs> Next up, we had Big Show and Brock Lesnar. More an angle than a match. Again, to line up Brock for what would be The Undertaker. He destroys the Big Show here. After attacking him pretty savagely. To the point where the crowd's so behind Brock, because, well, Brock's a badass. Nails him with a chair one more time. Now, that, 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 that small group that got sick of Brock, or sick of Brock now didn't really exist at this point. To me, I didn't, I didn't really see it much until, you know, he ended the streak. But, here, he's still very much, very much, you know, a, a, a big attraction. Like, he's still, you know, hey, he still is. Like, let's face facts. But I'm just saying that there was no social media backlash really yet against him at this point, at least not a significant one. And uh, I was half expecting the Big Show to cry about this on Raw the next day, considering what Big Show had been doing for <laughs> the majority of his career at this point. Well, I shouldn't say that, sorry. The majority of the last couple of years at this point. <sighs> now, I will say this. 
Whether you can criticize the all you want in this era, but one of the things they did right for a better part of a year at this point was the shield. The shield was almost flawless in the way they were booked. I really can't complain. And it established new stars that are still very relevant. Actually, no, sorry. I'm sorry. I hate that word relevant in wrestling these days. I, just, I don't even know why I use that. I freaking hate that word. But are still... But I mean it in a positive context, actually, to be honest. So, I don't know. What's the word? They're still they're still heavily prominent in the world of wrestling today, I should say. Of course, John Moxley doing very well. Dean Ambrose, a.k.a. Uh, doing very well in AEW. Seth Rollins, saying what you want about the Monday Night Messiah thing, but he's still an upper echelon guy. And Roman, need I say more? So next up, we have John Cena and Randy Orton. Again, fundamentally fine. They've had a million times better. The crowd starts chanting for Daniel Bryan. Some of you fans may recall the We Want Flair chants from wrestling fans after he had left the company at WCW in 1991. And then they resurfaced again in 98 when he was off television. So... The fans making it vocal that this is not the... At least the fans in attendance on this night. They This is not what they wanted. This isn't to say that every fan didn't want this. I'd be ignorant to say. I'm sure a great deal, a large, very large group of fans did want to see this. But at the same time, though, I think a significant enough group wanted the change. And I think it deflated the match somewhat, though, at the same time. Now, again, you can blame these fans for being entitled or trying to hijack. That's another buzzword I can't stand either. Hijack the show or whatever. I just think they really wanted Daniel Bryan. So, the Wyatts cost Cena this match. Orton keeps the championship. He's the unified champion at this point. Again, nothing necessarily wrong with this match at all. So there's that. (laughs) And at this point, I'm watching the show, and I look over to my girlfriend, and she says to me, she's like, what? You're not enjoying the show? And I'm like, I mean... It's fine. Like, it's not... I mean, it's the Royal Rumble, so we're going to get something out of it, but... It's, it's kind of lethargic in many ways. I don't know. I don't really know how to explain it. And then we got the Elimination Chamber commercial. And I remember... Because they, they, the poster had already leaked online, I believe, and it had Stephanie McMahon. I'm like, yeah, because why not? I, I'm sorry. Yes, she's a good a heel, a good... He- you know, she's good at being a heel. Yes, I'm not going to deny that. But by God, some of the things they do with her just make me want to bang my head. Like, here's my example I always go back to. That did it be protect Stephanie. Oh, Bill, you're just being ignorant You just because you don't like her. The segment with Daniel Bryan and her after SummerSlam is on YouTube. I mentioned this on a previous podcast. They cut out the entire part where he smacks the microphone out of her hand. Why? It was a big part of the promo. It got a nice pop. Both on the mic and the crowd. So I never... It seems like they go out of their way to protect her. Then there was the... Again, it was a rumor. It it, it might not be true, but I guess when she got upset when Dusty Rhodes... Yes, Dusty Rhodes. And if this is true, then this is this is terrible. Dusty Rhodes, one of the all-time greats. And you can say what you want about him, good or bad, in terms of his booking of philosophies and whatnot. Who, in my opinion, gave more to the business than he took away. And she gets upset for him putting her his hand in her face. The whole talk to the hand. Again, that was just a rumor. We don't know if it's true or not. Again, it could be just dirt sheet hoopla, but if it is true, then that's pathetic. But again, judging by the accounts of some people, 
It, it, it's very possible it could be true. So at this point, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm just drinking my beer, and I'm just wanting the rumble to start. So I'm like, okay, so the lead up to this, of course, CM Punk is still being held down by the authority or whatever, and Corporate Kane is targeting him. That's another head scratcher. So CM Punk is number one. That was, of course, the build-up. So, we're supposed to be expecting a great performance from Punk here. But little did we know, he was heavily injured at the time. He had what would later be revealed as a staph infection. So, you could you can you could you didn't notice it then, but when you the benefit of hindsight when you watch the show again, you see Punk is just looks very drained at this point. I mean, you can still see he's trying. But it, it, I didn't notice it at the time. This would literally be the last time CM Punk would work a match to this day. It has been 7 years. So Seth Rollins was number 2. The big thing about this rumble was that people were expecting Daniel Bryan to still appear in it and win it. That would have been great. And everyone at the bar was expecting it too. Hell, I was half expecting it. Kind of hoping for it too because I'm a Daniel Bryan fan. So the nice little opening sequence here with Punk and Rollins. And I, I even said it, I said to my girlfriend at the time, I said, Punk's not going to win this thing, but he'll probably go right to the end. So we get Damian Sandow, who I've always liked. An understar that I felt was squandered. Cody Rhodes later comes in. And now Punk. And Rhodes work Rollins over in that. And I guess this is off to a good start. There's a great talent in there. And here comes Corporate Kane. But he gets eliminated. Pretty damn quick. Which I was actually happy about. But for some reason, I had a feeling we were going to see him again. To be honest with you, I was counting on Triple H costing Punk the Rumble. That's that's actually what I was counting on. So, Rusev. At the time, Alexander Rusev before, I guess, Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn felt that day. You know, people don't want to say first and last names in wrestling. At this time, he was just a star on NXT. So, he actually gets a pretty good reaction. And it was good to see him. This is, I, this is what I still like that WWE does. They still give NXT guys a good rub in the Rumble and try to give them some good spots. He destroys everyone. Remember Swagger? As a ba- you know, he actually gets a babyface reaction for going after Rusev. And then there was Kofi... Then there's Jimmy Uso, and then Gold Dust. Now, Punk, not long after this, sustains what would later be revealed as a concussion. So, Punk is not doing much in this Rumble from going forward, pretty much. I mean, he does a few things here and there, but, you know, probably not the performance he wanted to put on. So, yeah, we got Jimmy Uso, Gold Dust. And I'll say this about this Rumble match. I'm into it. It's hard not to get into a Rumble match. Like, there's the thing. I never. Se- I don't consider any Rumble matches bad. Because you still have a match with 30 guys trying to tell a dozen different stories. And it, I've even heard from, like, you know, again, certain podcasts, it's one of the hardest matches to put together. And Bruce Pritchard has said it. It's one of the few times I'll believe Bruce. And, <laughs> and you know, a few others. Or JR has mentioned it. It's it's not easy. So if you, there's certain dead spots or whatever, then I mean, yes, some rumbles are better than others, obviously. But again, the '99 rumble was kind of laughable. I will say that if, if there's anything close to a bad rumble, it'd be '99. Just just that's just me though. So 
uh, the Kofi spot of the year that year, as he uh, as he gets put on the railing, as Punk chucked Kofi out of the ring. Rusev caught him, put him on the railing for a bit. I remember the whole bar is going nuts because they were waiting for the Kofi spot. And jumps from the uh, jumps from the barricade to the ring. So Dean Ambrose comes out, gets a good reaction. Dolph Ziggler gets a really good reaction here, actually. Our truth, who is pretty much doing nothing at this point, our truth kind of had, had a few just sleepy years before the 24/7 thing came into play. But kudos to him for staying employed all this time and collecting paydays. Probably he's made a decent living. Probably he was. I have a feeling. Sidebar here. I think our truth's gonna be a lifer. One of those lifer, you know, guys that'll just have a role with it to be even long after he retires. But again, he's what pushing fifty, I think, and he still looks good. He can. He's still funny. I still, I find him amusing. So, yeah, I think he's gonna. Be, I think he's a lifer at this point. But of course, Archer doesn't last very long. Ambrose gets rid of him. I'm not gonna go over every elimination here. That'd just be kind of, you know, kind of, kind of nothing. So next out is uh, Kevin Nash. Not near as excited as I was to see him a few years prior. Now I love Kevin Nash. I do. Yes, I know about maybe dozens of smart marks are like, what, how could you, he did the Nash is a great performer, in my opinion. But you can see here, you have, he's obviously not going to be in the Rumble very long, and Nash actually expressed a lot of frustration with this, uh, <laughs> with what happened in this Rumble. With just his spot with Roman and that. And yeah, yeah, Nash <laughs> was saying something like that just the spot was completely messed, because Roman is next. And he starts... Now, I was hoping Punk would finally eliminate Nash and just settle that whole thing that went unsettled, but now they barely even interacted. So, yeah. Oh, but uh, Nash got to toss Swagger out. For reasons, I guess. Um, actually, to be honest with you, the bar, when Nash came out, maybe four or five people cheered. I guarantee in 2011, when he, when he was in the Rumble, it was probably a wide cheer like it was in the theater I went to. He just... Nobody cared at this point, sadly. And again, I, I love Kevin. I've met him. I even helped him at his merch table at a charity show out in Pickering, Ontario. And he's a hell of a guy. Just a hell of a guy. And I, I also took pictures with him at another show. One of my favorite pictures to take with a wrestler ever. I could tell he was tired that day. I could tell he probably, part of him didn't want to be there, but he was still signing every fan's autograph, posing for pictures. You know, interacting a little bit. But no, when I actually uh, helped him at his merch table, he was great. We were talking basketball. I mean, he was just a, a fun guy. Very laid back. Very, very, he was he was Big Daddy cool. Very cool and collected. So yes, Roman just shit cans uh, uh, Kofi, Dolph, and Nash. I guess then there was a little uh, miscue with the whole thing with Nash. Which, it's not noticeable, really, until... Again, but you see when, after Nash talked about it, you can kind of, yeah, was what it was. Uh, this was great, though. This was actually unexpected. Great Kali is number 60. Now, usually Kali is not in there for a long time, but he usually causes some damage while he's there. Not this year. They actually gang up right away. The shield gangs up on him right away, and they get him out. Smart. Again, that's, to me, I like stuff like that. That's good storytelling. And the Goldust, uh, oh yeah, this is where Goldust accidentally puts Cody out. And then Roman takes care of Goldust. So Seamus, who'd been gone for a little while, um, actually gets a really good reaction for his return. And I actually, I you know, Seamus is someone who, it's hard to say. I, how, how, like Me personally, how do I describe Seamus? I thought he never was, like, you know, people sometimes balked him as a main eventer, but I never, I will say this about Sheamus as a main event guy. 
he never seemed to overstay his welcome. At least to me. I, I never got sick of him. Or I never... I mean, like I said, I wasn't a huge mark for Sheamus or anything like that, but I didn't mind him. I thought he was uh, good to watch. He wasn't boring. I thought his moves looked convincing. Uh, that bro kick, again, I think that's a great finisher. And uh, the the uh, the forearms, the chest, again, that's great stuff. Sheamus can play a heel. He can play a face. So for the most part, I've enjoyed Sheamus. Uh, the stuff he did with Cesaro was fantastic. Um, the stuff he was doing recently with Drew was pretty good. And so, like... I don't know. I just Seamus is someone who, again, I'm not gonna buy his T-shirt, but I'm I'm not gonna turn against him either. I guess you could say. So the Miz is out next, and uh, this is kind of at this point. You know, Miz uh, Miz has always been a great heel, but there, there have been periods of his career where he just kind of had a lot of down points, and this was one of them. Fandango, who was pretty much whatever credibility Chris Jericho gave him, was gone at this point. And the crowd is still hoping for Daniel Bryan. Not happening. Then we get El Torito at number 20, because why not? <laughs> Man. Roman is just kicking ass here. And he actually, Torito eliminates Fandango. Roman, thankfully, gets rid of Torito. Of course, the Cesaro Swain. At this point, Punk just can barely do anything, it seems, and that's not his fault. So we had Luke Harper and then Jey Uso coming in. And you see the rings filling up, and I even said to my buddy Justin, I said, Batista's coming in soon. JBL, number 24. As Michael Cole notes, the JBL character has never entered the Rumble before. Okay, then. And Roman makes sure we're him, thank God. Eric Rowan. Cryback. Del Rio. Yeah, it's kind of lethargic at this point, but again, this happens in Rumble, so I'm not... I'm sad or bo like bored, bored. I'm just thinking. I know something big. That's the thing. When these when these down points happen in Rumble, I know something or someone is coming out to really just crank things up. That's the purpose, at least, of these lull spots. To me, at least, they have a purpose. And boom, Batista out at 28. Now he's in the crowd instantly turns on him instantly because they know they know where this this is going now, but they're still holding out hope. That Daniel Bryan's coming out in this rumble. Biggie Langston, yes, again, before again, I guess before the WWE felt that fans couldn't uh, didn't want to use full names for chanting or stuff like that. I don't know. Their logic behind that's kind of f fucked. And again, the fans are sitting on the edge of their seats for number thirty, and it's Rey Mysterio. Oh, and I love Rey, but there was one time I didn't want to see him. It was this match. The crowd in Pittsburgh booed this mercilessly. The people and the the energy of the out of the bar at Absinthe was just sucked out of the place. Then we all know it came down to the final four: Punk, Roman, Sheamus, and Batista. Punk, of course, was screwed over by Kane. The spot out that I thought Triple H was actually going to get involved in, but it still made sense in a way. Lots of sign pointing, crowd shitting on that, and the bar, the bar on that just doesn't seem to care. This does not seem to care. Hell, I barely cared at this point. Boom, boom, like, you know, it's like, ugh. So Roman eliminates Sheamus to set the elimination record. The crowd is so against Batista being pushed as for the main event for Mania that they're cheering for Roman. Well, what a difference a year would make after that, huh? And, and of course, Batista wins. Pretty much telling people to deal with it, which to me is one of the... If this is really the plan all along, the whole deal with it catchphrase. If the, the Batista was was the plan and not Daniel Bryan, if he didn't factor in at all, the whole deal with it. That's very condescending. Just a slap in the face to your fans. 
That's just the way I see it, though. Anyway. Punk is gone. And we're off to WrestleMania. In terms of surrealism, this show ranks right up there with the 1991 WCW Great American Bash. Ranks pretty high up there. For the WWF, this was their ni- WWE. This is their 91 Bash moment. But of course, eventually things went the way the fans wanted. By WrestleMania, Daniel Bryan had a great babyface performance that night. One of my all-time favorite performances from a babyface wrestler at WrestleMania 30. And he did it. He did it. <sighs> and I actually did a podcast about Daniel Bryan. You can check that out in the archives. I talk a lot more about that. So again, check that out. So that was Royal Rumble 2014. The next episode that I will be posting, the same day I'm posting this, I'm going to be doing Royal Rumble 1994. Oh, yes. Double the fun. <laughs> and a very interesting show, to say the least. I remember... I remember one of my fondest memories as a kid was that, that year's uh, Royal Rumble. So I'm going to be going over that as well. So again, thank you for joining me. If you want to add me on social media, BillChase33 on Instagram, BillChase33 on Twitter. Also, uh, I'm on Facebook. If you want to add me and just talk some wrestling, especially some old wrestling, by all means, please do. So until next time, this is your friend and mine, Bill Chase, quoting my fellow native Hamiltonian, the late great Billy Red Lions, when I tell you all, don't you dare miss it. Thank you for listening to Diary of a Wrestling Fan with Bill Chase. If you'd like to make a contribution to the show, just remember, don't ever ask Bill to do an episode about Nia Jax's whole 